Hello everybody, my name is Fiona McPherson and I'll be hosting today's event. Um, could I ask Janet, could you just, thank you, I was going to say, could you just put the presentation up for me, that's great. Um, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Open University to our webinar on making the most of your brand. On today's session, we've got Janet Barker from the Open University who's providing support in the background. Our presenter today is Jennifer Holloway and Jane Barrett from the Cream Farm who will be hosting the Q&A session during the webinar. Before we start, I'd just like you to familiarize yourself with using WebEx if you haven't used it before. I know some of you may be new to our webinar sessions, um, so I'm just going to help you familiarize yourself with the screen. As you can see on the main part of the screen, you can see any um, materials that we're going to share with you. So at the moment, we've got a presentation up there. Um, we will also be sharing a video with you as well, so that's where you can actually um, see the content. At the top of your screen, you'll see you've got an audio broadcast box, and this is where you can adjust the volume. Um, so if you need to turn it up or down, you can do that there. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a couple of tabs. Um, we've got the Participant tab and the Q&A tab. You'll be using these during the session, so we're just going to have a quick practice just to help you familiarize yourself. Okay, so first of all, if you can click on the participant panel, if you've not already selected it, and then go down to the bottom and click on the show hand icon. That's great. Okay, so at some point, Jennifer might ask you for a show of hands, and if so, that's how you would actually do that. Okay. Now, if you can click on the tick icon, I want you to answer the following question with either a yes or a no. Have you attended a webinar before? Okay, that's great. So a few of you have and a few of you haven't. So we've got some new people, so that's great. Okay, so that's how you use the feedback buttons. Now we're just going to take a look at the Q&A panel, and you'll be using this during the session, and this is where you'll actually submit your questions. So in order to actually send a question, you need to select panelist from the Ask a drop-down menu, type in your question, and then click on send. And what we're going to do is Jane's going to be taking questions um, as we go through the session and actually posing those to Jennifer. So if you do have any questions as we go along, if you want to send those through, through the panel, that would be great. So for a quick practice, if you just want to select panelists from the Ask menu, and then just type in whereabouts you are geographically today and click on Send. Okay, we've got Jackie in Nottingham. And we've got Rekula in Basel, Ma Michelle in Cambridge, Derek in Blackburn, Darren in London, Julia in Harlow. The rest of you are a bit shy, I think. Okay, we've got Kareen and Milton Keynes. I'm sure we've all got lovely weather at the moment, so I know we have up here. Okay, so that's how you would actually submit your questions. Um, at the end of the session, there will be a Open University survey, um, and we would appreciate it, obviously, if you just take a couple of minutes just to complete that at the end. That would be great. So now I'm just going to introduce our presenter. Um, today is Jennifer Holloway, who is the founder of Spark and author of Personal Branding for Brits. Before I hand you over, I'm just going to ask Janet to share a short video of Jennifer, and then she's going to put up some questions for you to answer, um, and then Jennifer will take over.
Hello? Janet? Those are the wrong questions. They are. Janet, can you put up the questions where there are the four questions together? That's it. Great. Thank you. Apologies, everybody. <laughs> right, polls has gone up now. Hello, Jennifer. You can, you've got control now. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this webinar about personal brand. Uh, you might think it's a bit odd. I've gone on a webinar about personal brand, and I've watched a short video of, of the presenter, and then I've been asked four questions. So what's all that about? Well, the reason is that New York University did a study, and they said it takes only seven seconds for someone to form their first impression of you. So when you meet someone for the first time and you walk in and you offer your hand and you shake their hand and you say your name and they say theirs, that's about seven seconds that has gone by. And according to New York University, that is all that you each need to form your first impression of each other. And your first impression tends to be the instant that your brand is created in someone else's mind. And that can have an awful lot of impact, especially when you realize just quite how much people are picking up about you. The study that the university did showed that in the first seven seconds, these are the things that people pick up about you. So if you just read through that list, now, I think it's interesting that um, you can actually go into that much detail about someone in seven seconds. Because the first time I saw this list, I thought, that is a lot of information to pick up in such a short amount of time. But here's how first impression works. When you meet someone, your brain is desperately trying to understand as quickly as possible, who is this person? What do I think about them? What are they all about? And am I going to buy into them? And so what that you're trying to do is look for clues. You're trying to go for the smallest little thing. Your brain's going, give me any bit of information I can, I can get to be able to answer those questions. So for instance, when you meet someone and you see that they've got a wedding ring on their finger, you've instantly got the answers to numbers one and two on that list there. Their desirability and possibly even their sexuality. So, you know, something, someone found them desirable enough to marry, and you get an idea whether it was someone of the same sex or the opposite sex. When you hear someone's accent, you know, when they introduce themselves to you and they have an accent, that can also tell you huge amounts about numbers three to six. You know, their education, their politics, where they're from, what their religion might be. And there was actually a study was done by the Aziz Corporation, and they got people with very strong regional accents to record the same bits of prose. They then played those recordings without any, without any visual, just the, the sound recordings to people, and the question was asked, is this person successful in business? When people were played the home counties accent, you know, hello, my name is Jennifer Holloway, I'm from the home counties, three quarters of people asked automatically said that person was successful in business. 
just on hearing their accent. When they were played the Birmingham accent, which sounds a little bit like this, they were then asked, how is this person in business? And two-thirds of people, just on hearing that accent, said that person is not successful. I'm not saying whether that is right or whether that is wrong, but it shows you how we are pre-programmed with stereotypes, with everything that has gone on in our life up to this point, where our brain takes that clue and references it against what we've got in our heads already and comes up with an answer. So if you have an accent when you're going out there and promoting your brand, it's worth considering, is this creating a favorable or an unfavorable impression? If there's any of you, actually, it would be great if we could just have a show of hands. How many of you, when you meet someone for the first time, uh, very, very closely look at what they're wearing, maybe their shoes, maybe their handbags, you know, particularly uh, watches? Do any of you do that? We've got some hands going on there. Excellent. What you're doing there, again, is looking for those clues to things like number seven, number eight, and nine and ten. So how sophisticated are they? I mean, are you someone that when you spot a nice watch on a man, you think, right, okay, they've got a bit of, of wealth. How did they afford that? They must be reasonably successful. How credible are they? That's all tied up in you trying to understand who this person is. Number 11 on the list, trustworthiness, is much more of a gut feel. We meet people and we just think, do I trust you? Do I not trust you? Um, I'm sure you can all think of a time when you've met someone and you've either instantly clicked with them and you've had that instant buy-in and other times when you can't quite put your finger on it, but yeah, I'm not sure we're going to get on. So first impressions, you might think when you're going about your day or you know, you're doing business with people that all you're doing is you're, you're dealing with the matter in hand. You've gone into a meeting with an agenda and that's what's really important. In actual fact, when it comes to personal brand, you need to be thinking but hold on, what's happening in the first seven seconds? Harvard did a separate study, and they said when it comes to first impressions, on average, they will be 80% accurate, which is pretty good going. Now, what I thought was actually more interesting about that study was they said that when that first impression is formed, even once someone gets to know you, they've spent more time with you, they've picked up more clues, they've maybe adapted their view of you, that first impression still lodges itself in their brain, and it will continue to form the lion's share of what they think. And as you only get one chance to make a first impression, it does really matter. So just as a bit of fun for you and also a bit of an introduction to me, the reason we showed you that video and asked you those questions was to see how what good you are at picking up first impressions. The video we showed you was actually twice as long as seven seconds. It was 14 seconds. So um, let's see how you do. So we asked you with the first question was, where am I from geographically? Your options were the north of England, A, the south of England, B, uh, another European country, and a non-European country. Now, when we looked at the polls, um, can, Janet, can we show the poll? Um, how do oh, was, if I look at the polling? Um, we had a lot of people didn't answer, but we had sort of a, a general split. I'm actually from the south of England, if I'm from anywhere. Um, I currently live in Yorkshire. If any of you have ever seen the film Calendar Girls with the Naked WI, that's where I come from at the moment. But most of my life has been spent in London and the south of England. It, interestingly, um, I did put D on there, a non-European country. No one's gone for it, but I was actually born in Canada, and sometimes people with a very good ear uh, pick up an accent. So that, if you said London and the Southeast, give yourself a point. What level of education do I have? Now, again, you'll have been trying to pick that up from, you know, my body language in the video and my voice. Uh, you had the option of I left school at 16 with only basic qualifications. I went to university and I have a degree. I went to further than university and I have a master's or that I've completed an MBA. Well, the answer to that one, and only 3% of you got this right, was I actually left school at uh, 16. I have my GCSEs, and I went off to become a graphic designer and uh, quite quickly realized I'm not a very good graphic designer. So about the same time as I was learning to drive, I actually decided to change careers, and I went into PR. 
And for the next 15 years, I have been in, in press offices and then running press offices. Now, when it comes to promoting your personal brand, that is where you really learn the ropes. Because if a journalist does not rate you, a journalist will not listen to what you have to say. So it's very important to say to sell yourself before you sell your business. And as you are going about in your careers, it's important to realize that you might be going out there trying to sell your skills and to say, here's what I have to offer. But if it doesn't come with some sort of selling of the person as well, it makes it harder for people to buy in. So the third question I asked you was, what make of car do I drive? Uh, that's a Ford in the photo. <laughs> it's the only Ford I ever drove because, quite frankly, it really wasn't a very good car. So uh, what I drive now is an Audi, although I also drove VWs for a long time. So 10% of you got that right. Congratulations if that was you. Um, the thing about cars is that they're very good at depicting outwardly what someone's personal brand might be. Um, people tend to go for something where the company brand has elements that reflect their own. So the reason I choose German cars is I think that they've got a dependability and a solidity about them that says not too flash, but you know what, they can absolutely be relied on, which totally matches my own brand. And then the last question I asked you was, um, what is my relationship status? Uh, a was single, B was in a relationship and no children, C in a relationship with children, and D was divorced. Um, that was equal split, uh, I'm single or in a relationship with no children. Uh, B is the right answer. And in actual fact, um, where I live in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, chickens and bees are about all as much as I'm allowed to look after, live our little version of the good life. So Harvard said, on average, you should be getting 80% accuracy. So it'd just be really great if we just go back to um, having a look at how many of you got three, maybe even all four right. So if we could just do a show of hands. Some of you have still got your hands showing from previously. But how many of you got a decent amount? Oh, hands are disappearing. <laughs> Jackie Blakemore, you've just put your hand back up. Congratulations. So all of this comes down to the fact that in business, people buy people. And I don't just mean business people, us buying salespeople, you know, are we going to buy something from them? I mean that throughout your career, as you make your way along through different roles, your ability to get a job and your ability to do a job will very much hinge on if you are buying people and if they are buying you. Now, that's really quite obvious. However, the bit of thinking that people often haven't done is the next bit. It's your personal brand that says, here's what you'll get when you buy into me. So if you imagine yourself in a supermarket, okay, and you're looking at the washing powders, and there is shelf upon shelf upon shelf of washing powder, and essentially these things are all doing the same thing. They are getting your clothes clean, okay? So why do you choose one over another? What happens is the companies that produce those washing powders go to a lot of effort to create a brand that sits alongside that. So the package which has got the picture of the field on it and it's got flowers and everything says, yes, I wash your clothes and we'll be kind to the environment. The one that's got the bright blue lettering and the big bold uh, writing is saying, yes, we'll get your clothes clean and you will also have money in your pocket because we're really cheap. And the one that's got the picture of the orchids and the flowers says, yes, we'll get your clothes clean and you will smell gorgeous. The reason they go to the effort of packaging and getting uh, um, their logo right and the colors right is because they're trying to help you. Your brain is looking for clues, exactly as I said before, to say what matters to me and which one of these washing powders is giving it to me. So if you're someone who wants clean clothes and you also like to be kind to the environment, you're going to pick that one over the other one. Your personal brand is there to work in exactly the same way. So you might have a CV that says, I can do accountancy and I've got this qualification, etc., etc. That's the equivalent of getting clothes clean. What your personal brand does, though, is it says, and here's what else you get when I do it. That is the bit that is becoming more and more important these days because 
that differentiation and making sure you stand out from the crowd just on the what you do is very, very difficult. Your USP, your unique selling point, tends to be more who you are, and that's what your brand depicts. So it's now probably a good point to just talk about what is a personal brand, because people have very different definitions of it. So it would just be really good for me if you can just type in um, the Q&A box. If you were thinking about your personal brand, what would you say is your definition of what a personal brand is? If anyone can just put some comments up, or just if you just do ask it in the Q&A box, it's called probably easiest. We can just see how would you define a personal brand? How you package yourself, Emma? Yeah, that's definitely right, particularly in terms of how you look and what your image is. That's absolutely true. Anyone else? Your personality, definitely. How you behave, the way that you market yourself and your skills. It says, it says what and who you are how you portray yourself, how people experience me. Yeah, these are all really great answers. Your reputation, Michelle, absolutely. You're on the money with that one. Intelligence, yes, what you know, that's definitely part of it. Anyone else? Your level of authority, yes, Ewan. So as you can see, I'm, every single one of you that just put an answer in there, you are absolutely right. The problem comes is that your brand can be so complicated because it is made up of so many different things that you can end up losing a bit of definition. So when I first started doing personal branding, I created what I call the personal brand pyramid. Now this, if any of you have did any sociology at school like I did, and you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you don't need to know what that is, but basically I pinched, <laughs> pinched the outlook and just added it, applied it to personal brand. Because I believe that your brand comprises of six layers, and I'm now just going to talk you through each one of those. Now, as I'm doing that, I want you, I'm going to ask you some questions on each of the layers. And just for your own sake, just with a pen and paper, just wherever you are, just want you to think about what your answers would be to those questions, okay? So we'll start with image, because image is usually the first way that people get an experience of your brand. Now, image denotes that it's probably a visual thing, but also, if you think about it, it's what they're hearing and it's what they're feeling about you at the same time. So when you're thinking about your image, I want you to ask yourself, how would I describe how I look? Just write down whatever comes into your head. Think about how would I describe how I sound. How would I describe how I communicate? What clues am I trying to give people with what I wear? When you're thinking about your image, those are the sorts of questions you want to be asking. Now, if someone has a strong personal brand, they will often give you in the image layer all the clues you need to what's going to be sitting above it in the personal brand levels. So when you work out what your brand is, you also need to work out how do I convey that through my image. The second layer on there is skills. Now, um, in the questions we said earlier, uh, Jackie, you said how you market yourself and your skills. This is, that would come in here. Um, you, how, what you know, that would come in here. Skills are essentially what you bring to the table. Okay, so when you're asking yourself about your skills, I want you to write down or think about what do I do incredibly well? What? are my strengths. Now think not just in terms of qualifications or any sort of practical skills you have, but it might be a behavior you have that is also a skill. You could be incredibly persuasive. That is a skill as much as a behavior. Think to yourself, what is the thing that people come to me for that they don't go to anyone else? 
Okay, so that's the second layer of your brand. And if you have any questions as we're going through, if you want a little bit more definition, just let me know. Behavior, that's the next layer. Essentially, and I'm just going to look back and see who it was who said, Marius, you said personality was how you would denote personal brand. Your answer would definitely sit in this layer. Your behavior is your personality, because you can have two people on an image layer dressed in exactly the same uniform, on a skills layer doing exactly the same job, but at the behavior layer, that's when you start getting a bit of differentiation. So my question to you is, how would you describe your personality? What words would you use to describe your character? Okay. Those first three layers are what I term the tangibles. They're the things that are fairly readily available about your brand. I can see what you look like, I can tell what you're good at, and I can experience your behavior. Traditionally, those are the layers that we have been promoting about ourselves. We're quite happy to talk to people about what we're good at and you know, have a bit of personality. The next three layers are a bit more intangible, though. They're much harder to grasp. They're much more, uh, much more emotional, a lot less logical. So these are often the ones that people keep to themselves. But in actual fact, as personal brand becomes more important because Everyone can do what everyone can do, so you need to sell the who you are as well. It's this part of your brand that needs to come out a bit more. So if I just talk you through these three layers, we have reputation. And Michelle, you were right on the money when you said that is what personal brand is. Now, we're going to talk about this a bit further in a minute. Your reputation is technically what other people think of you. But when it sits in your brand, that is your definition of what you want people to think of you. So my question to you is just that. What do you want people saying about you when you're not in the room? What does it really matter that you are known for? Okay. We're now going to move on to drivers. That's the next level. So your drivers are the part of your brand where you define and set out very clearly for yourself, this is what matters to me about what I do or who I am. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. So there's my question. What motivates you? What do you most enjoy about what you do? And why do you enjoy it? Because it's likely to be a driver. That's drivers. And then the last thing on the pyramid there, and although it's at the top and it's smallest, it's actually, it, it's some people, it's, it's where your brand actually starts is with your values. So your values essentially are that moral compass that you have within you that says this is right and this is wrong. So my question is, what are your values? What are the things that matter so much to you that they are non-negotiable? If someone was to ask you to go against them, you would refuse. So there you have, in a very uh, simplistic and easy to follow form, six aspects of your personal brand. Now when it comes to defining your brand, and I'm going to show you examples very soon, it's about using that as a real focus for out of all the things you could be selling someone, out of all the things you could be saying you're good at or all the rep behaviors you could be having, what are the two or three that are absolutely top of the pile that are, when you put them all together create the best version of who you are? That's what you're aiming for when you're doing a brand. Now, when I go through, when you go through this, you know, in much more detail, and you know, when uh, if we were to do a longer workshop on this, what you would do is spend a lot of time really digging down, getting as many answers to those questions out of your head and onto paper as you could. The thing you then need to do is, as I say, pick out the best things that really matter. Now, when you're doing that, 
it's very important to keep in mind one thing. And I call it, you need to remember to go at nine and a half miles an hour. Let me explain what I mean. This picture comes from a newspaper article. And what the story was all about was stupid signs. Okay, so basically that man, you can just see in the background, there's a digger. He's on a building site, and he works on there, and he was interviewed for the newspaper article. And he was talking about this sign that had been put up on the site. And he said, this is such a stupid sign because we do not even have speedometers on our vehicles on this site. How are we meant to know how fast we're going? And when I was reading this article, I absolutely agreed. I thought, goodness, this is so stupid. However... A bit later on in the article, they interviewed the foreman who had put this sign up. And he said it was never about the speed. When we had a red circle and it said 10 miles an hour in it, no one took any notice of it because they'd seen it so many times, they just drove by it and their brain didn't even register it. Ever since we've put this up, the speeds have dropped and the accidents have dropped. So when you're talking about your brand, you need to be very careful not to fall into the trap of promoting yourself with exactly the same language and all the same ingredients that everybody else is promoting themselves. It's very much about trying to think, how can I say something or do something that will illustrate my brand in a way that will make people's brains go, ah, what's that? So... As a for instance, if we go back to the personal brand pyramid and you think about what your values might be, if we could just do, a, again, a really quick show of hands, I'd love to see how many of you, when I asked you what your values are, put honesty. Okay, if you just click on the hand to show. Oh, have I got some hands? We've got some down there. Right, okay, we've got a few of you who've got honesty. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. So here's the thing. Out of everybody who's on this webinar today, some of you, I don't know, half a dozen of you, have said, right, okay, honesty is my value. So if your brand is about making you different from everybody else, we've gone from lots of people, 36 attendees, down to six of you. You've pulled yourself into a smaller group. That is a good thing. However, wouldn't it be better still if you can pull yourself into a little group of one? So when I've asked people before now who have said honesty is their value, what do you really mean by honesty, you actually realize that there's quite a few different ways of looking at it. I had one person who said to me, honesty is not telling a lie. That's what honesty is to them. Someone else said honesty to me is speaking up and saying what needs to be said when I'm asked. If I'm asked a question, I'll give an honest answer. That's another view. Someone else said to me, I don't even need to be asked. I will say what needs to be said if it has to be said. There it is again. Someone else has said, honesty to me is being true to yourself, never going against your values. So you can already see that as soon as you start describing your brand just as honesty, that's not bad, but it's a little bit 10 miles an hour. If you can describe your brand as, I'm someone who likes to speak up when no one else will, or I believe that actually you need to be true to yourself, you start talking just that bit deeper, that little bit more nine and a half miles an hour language that makes people really get to the heart of who you are. What I'd like to do now is just share with you a couple of personal brands of people I've worked with and just show you the sorts of things that you might have. So the first one, I'm just going to put it up and I'd like you to just read through it and then we will just have a quick show of hands because I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Okay, I hope you've all had a chance to read through that brand. Now, this is the brand of someone who you've never met. You don't know if it's a man or a woman, and you only know six sentences about them. 
But if we go back to what I said at the beginning about people by people, just with a show of hands, please, and I'd really like to see, there's no right or wrong, but who of you, if people by people, just based on this brand, would probably buy that person's brand? You know, if you met them, you think they'd be a brand that you'd buy. Jackie says, yes. Derek, Julia, Emma, yeah. There's quite a lot of you. Now, I want you to ask yourself, wow, this is good. Jane, Ursula, Carrie, you'll, you'll all put your hands up. Thank you. That's really great. What I want you to ask yourself is, why would I buy this brand? I'm thinking that your answer will involve something like, because there's some aspect of it that is very similar to my brand. Because although people buy people, the actual thing is people buy people like themselves. So on some level, you will probably find something appeals to you. Now, those of you who didn't put your hands up, it might be that on all those levels, actually, you're the complete opposite of what's up on there. But actually, just as an aside, if we take this as an example of a personal brand, when you get to define yourself in only six sentences, you really are starting to talk about the best aspects of you. And as just as an example of that, digging down a bit deeper and making something go from 10 miles an hour to 9.5 miles an hour, if we take the uh, third level down, it says, I'm known for delivering under pressure, often with an added extra that wasn't even asked for. So this, and I'll share this with you, this is a lady called Natalie. She's a creative designer for Hallmark Cards, and she's very happy for me to share her brand. So she could have just said, I deliver under pressure. So that would have put her in a group from the people who don't deliver under pressure. But she wanted to pull herself out a bit more. So she said, not only do I deliver under pressure, I do an added extra that wasn't even asked for. She's just pulled herself a little bit further away from the people who deliver under pressure, but just do what's required. So can you see how you're able to dig down? The top layer, her values, I respect others and I'm always truthful. Dig down a bit more. I believe honesty can get you far. So when you're thinking about your brand, really ask yourself, what do I really mean by? How can I get myself into a little bit more of a smaller group by myself? I'd just like to share with you now another very different personal brand pyramid and give you a second to read it through. So if you could all just make sure your hands, uh, you know, your hand selections are off, and then I'd like to ask you the same question. With people by people, who of you would buy this very different brand? Michelle, a few of you, Darren, Michelle, you can like both of them, it's perfectly. Rajendra, there we go. So again, I would suggest that there would be some aspects of this brand that match your own brand. It might be taking pride in your work. It might be being supportive and caring but taking tough decisions when they're called for. So there you have a couple of examples of personal brand. How people would use them then, if you get yourself to this stage, it's very much about having that as a real focus that before you go out and promote your brand, you need to have absolute clarity about what it is that you're selling. And that's what this does. You don't necessarily go out there and hand people copies of your brand pyramid and say, hello, my name is, this is all, if you want to know about me, here's who I am. You can do that, of course. Um, I've had people who have shared their personal brand with their team to be able to get more buy-in and more understanding. But it's using it as a reference point for those times when you really need people to buy you. So maybe you're about to do a really important presentation Reread your brand and think about what is it I'm selling up on that stage. If you're going for an interview, what is it I'm selling in that room? If you've got a new boss starting, what is it that I need them to know about me? And because you'll have done all your thinking now, it means that what you're selling will just be that, clear, that much clearer and hopefully be bought into that much quicker. Now, what we've been talking about so far is your brand as it appears in your mind your perception of your image, skills, behavior, reputation, drivers, and values. And that's incredibly important. 
But what I'd like you to realize is the real, real power of your brand is the fact it exists in everybody else's head as well. When you are out in business and people buy people, it's what's said when you are not in the room that has the real impact. And I want you to ask yourself, what is it people say about me? Because I guarantee you that when your name is mentioned, there will automatically be a comment that gets added whenever you're not in the room. It could be something that's very good. It could be they're an amazing networker or, oh, he's <coughs> always so well-dressed or they've always got the right answer. They don't stop until they get to the solution. They're great at creating harmony in the team. Those are incredibly good brands to have. It could be something that's a bit bad and good. It could be, yeah, he can be a bit, he can be a bit miserable, but he's really loyal to his team. She can be a bit pushy, but you know what? She gets the job done. Or she might look a little bit of an airhead, but really, that woman knows her stuff. Jennifer, can I yeah. just um, just jump in here? Yeah. I think your point here is really, really useful because I think you know we, it's one thing to um, it, it's one thing to kind of know your brand, but it's also knowing what other people think about you, and particularly yeah. with things like three sixties, which quite a few people might have here might have had that. Um, had some experience of doing that at work, and I'm sure you've had experience of doing 360 degree feedback. And I certainly have with people is when they say, but, that, that, but surely people don't think that about me. And, and yeah. you say, well, this is what they've said. It doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. It's just their perception of you. Yes, yes. And it can do so a lot I think, of good. Yeah. It can do a lot of damage. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a really important point. Yes, and to your career. And I think the, the point to make as well is that Getting a good reputation in other people's minds is a full-time job. Uh, well, mm. not full-time. It's a constant. So if you're, if, when you're thinking about your career, what we tend to do is, right, I need to get a job, so I put in a lot of effort getting my brand out there and getting people to think positively about me and you know, putting out good messages, and I get this job, mm -hmm. and I just do the job. until It's like mm. a step. And then until I need another job, then I put a lot of effort in, and I get the job, and then I just do the job. And if you imagine steps mm. going up, what we need to be doing is more of just a steady slope. It's making sure that you are putting out positive messages about your brand all the time to keep topping up your reputation in people's minds. Because what and can I, I, happen... Mm. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I think, you know, with the stakeholders in your career, because I think particularly as you become more senior in an organization, there are definite stakeholders in your career, and it's about influencing them. And as you become more senior... It's not, you know, it, obviously there are skills that you have, but there are all those softer skills influencing your, your reputation, your visibility within the organization, and how you manage that moving yeah, forward. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But it's making sure that whilst a good brand needs nurturing, I'll tell you something, mm -hmm. if you get a bad brand, you don't need to do anything because that sticks <laughs> in your mind and it doesn't go away even if you want it to. I knew um, a journalist who, when I worked in PR, who whenever her name was mentioned, the little comment that would get added was, oh, that girl can drink. And it didn't matter okay. who you spoke to, this woman who had started off with a reputation of, wow, she always gets the story, had gradually over time gone to lots of press parties and got incredibly drunk and made an absolute fool of herself again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So her brand went from she can get the story to... She can get the story, but blimey, she doesn't half drink. To just, mm. blimey, that girl can drink. And in the mm. end, it made such a difference to her career that no one would speak to her. No one could trust her. I heard that she had to actually give up her career in London and move back to Scotland and almost restart it because the bad reputation had taken such a hold, she couldn't shake it. And I think, and, and sometimes it can be about not having, nobody has a view about you because they don't know who you are as well. Yeah, and that, that can be the other side of it. We have a question actually, yeah, Jennifer, exactly. from uh, yeah. Jackie. Yeah. Um, when you want to move up an organization that you've been with for a long, for a while, how can you change the brand that people have already formed of you? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it happens to a lot of people where maybe they've gone in on a graduate scheme and, you know, so they're then they've worked their way up, but there's still people mm -hmm. there who still see them as, oh, yeah, you're the grad. Um, it, partly it's a case of asking yourself how much 
is how far away is the impression people have from me from whatever they've based it on years ago from where I am now. Is that gap bridgeable? Because sometimes, mm-hmm. I'll be brutally honest, it is just it, when you move on, you have a brand new sheet of paper and you can start again. Yeah. If you really yeah. enjoy being in the organization, though, and you do want to change your, your people's perceptions of you, you have to try very hard once you know what your brand is and you've got in your mind a very clear definition of what you want them to say about you, you need to be trying to get that message out there as much as possible through everything you say and do. Because if you d- just leave people to form their own opinion, they'll form their own opinion. But if you put messages out there saying, here's what you should be thinking about me, here's what you need to know about me, not quite in that wording, obviously, but, you know, mm-hmm. then you put stuff in their brain that they'll start taking into account. So it's a case of if you want to move up in an organization you've been with for a while, people often say to me, oh, and I, so I'm just doing a really good job, and then I'll get noticed. That doesn't really happen as much as it should. It's not fair, Mm -hmm. but actually, if you just think doing your job is enough to get you ahead, you'll probably find you don't go at the speed you should be going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope that's answered Jackie's question. She she can feel free to ask another one if she if she needs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll let you carry on. (laughs) Thank you, Jackie. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So when you you do really need to ask it and I mean I I hope that while you while we've been discussing this you've been thinking to myself yeah what do people say when I'm not in the room it will be different depending on if it's you know your boss or your colleagues or someone external but the point is and and here's here's a perfect example I worked with one CEO and he said to me whenever I'm about to interview for a job I go and find that person on LinkedIn and I see how I'm connected to them and I phone the people that we have in common, and I say, right, tell me about John. And whatever they say has a very, very big part in my decision of whether I hire them. So before that person's even walked in the door, I've got their brand in my head because of what everybody else has said. And people often don't consider that things are being said when you're not in the room. So actually open your eyes and open your ears and start asking yourself. It can be a bit frightening thinking, ooh, what do people think about me? But you know what? Burying your head in the sand is not going to change what they're saying, and it's much better to know. Because that nine times out of ten, it's something fantastic anyway. But sometimes it's just the little things that can make a difference. So I'm going to move on now. Once you, We're going to assume that you know what your personal brand is. You've spent the time defining yourself. How can you use your personal brand? If you do nothing else and you get yourself to the point where you know what is in each of those sections of the pyramid for you and you know that it's all coherent and you've tested it and you've checked with other people, yeah, that's what your brand is, you will, I guarantee you, gain confidence. You can gain confidence from just understanding what makes you tick. You can gain confidence from having a very clear idea of who the authentic you is and if you're not being that person, getting yourself back there. You can get confidence from hearing feedback on you that says, yeah, you, what you're selling is what people are buying. I just want to share with you a little bit of how I got confidence from my brand. Becomes, it comes with a very important lesson about personal branding. So when I started my business in 2008, the first brand I worked on was mine. And I spent a lot of time thinking about who am I, you know, what are my values, what are my drivers, what matters to me. And I got my pyramid defined. I then sent out questions to people I'd worked for, who I'd worked with, got some feedback on my brand because I needed to check that how I saw myself was how they saw me. One client who I'd done some work with, who as far as I was concerned, had loved everything we'd done and, you know, he'd just totally bought into my brand. He gave me a bit of feedback. He said, Jennifer, your brand is strong like double espresso, but sometimes I'd wanted tea. Now, when I got this feedback, I was absolutely mortified because I had no idea that I had been anything other than fantastic for this guy. And here he was saying, yeah, you gave me what I wanted, but you didn't give me everything I wanted. And I have to say, I was so mortified, I, well, I burst into tears, quite frankly, and I started worrying, oh my goodness. And the comment, I wanted tea, basically hit all of the parts of my brand that I know are not brilliant because we all have them no one is perfect so it basically said to me you didn't listen enough because you didn't even realize i wanted tea 
You were too loud because all you gave me is coffee. You were too opinionated, all you gave me is coffee. You know, it was all about you, not enough about me. All you gave me is coffee. And I really worried about this because I was running a business and my first thought was, right, okay, in that case, I need to become more like T. And then it hit me. Hold on a minute. My brand that I'd spent a very long time thinking about, if you had to give it anything off the menu in Starbucks, it's double espresso. I can't give this person tea because if I did, I would not be authentic. I can't be coffee and tea at the same time. They're too different. When anyone meets me, you saw on that video, you know, it's very obvious that I'm someone who is more on the coffee end of the scale. You know, I have confidence. I wear bright red lipstick and, you know, my image is giving you all those clues. I'm very consistent. You always get coffee with me. Sometimes you get decaf and sometimes you get triple espresso, but I'm always coffee. And the lesson that, and the confidence I got from this, and this is what I really want you on this webinar to understand today, is not everyone will buy your personal brand. As long as you are remaining authentic, you're being clear about who you are, and you are consistent with that, you can be happy that actually it's better to be true to your own brand and to sell what you have to sell, what you've thought about, what you've checked with other people, than it is to try and change who you are for who you think people want you to be, because that is very difficult to keep up. And actually, you might think you're being the master of kidding someone. I could think I was the master of telling someone I was tea, but in actual fact, people can smell a fake, and then they stop buying you. So it is very important that people buy people, but we won't buy everyone, and that's absolutely fine. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Right. I just want to talk to you now then, because we're getting near the end, about how you promote your personal brand. This is the bit that if you want to move your career to the next level, you want to get onto that project you really want, you want that promotion, that new job, you need more buy-in from your boss. Getting your brand out there, Jackie, this is the sort of thing we were talking about before, promoting your personal brand and sharing it with people. Now, as I said, lots of people say to me, my work should speak for itself. But do you know what? That isn't enough anymore. There was a radio uh, program I was listening to when I was driving home from a client's one day, and it was a phone-in show about redundancy. And this woman was on there, and she was very upset. She'd phoned in because she'd lost her job just very recently. And she was telling the presenter that she was so upset because she had given her life to that company. She'd always been the first one in in the morning. She'd always been the last one to leave at night. She'd never taken her lunch hour. And her words were, I was the hardest working person in that office. How could they let me go? And when I was driving along listening to her, I felt very sorry for her. You know, no one wants to be made redundant. But here's the thing. You can be the hardest working person in your office but if no one knows you're the hardest working person, it doesn't count for anything. If you think that just coming in early, if I'm your boss and all I see is I say good morning to you in the morning, I say good night to you in the evening, and I see that you never leave your desk, that's the only message I'm getting, which could actually be read as, can you do your job? You need to be going out there and sharing the fact that you are good at your job with people. It's a case of balancing the substance that you already have with a bit of style on top. You can't be all style because people need to get what you're promising to deliver. The good news about promoting your personal brand is people often say to me, oh, but I'm going to sound arrogant or, you know, people think I'm a big head. Number one, if you are already thinking I might sound arrogant, good news. You have an inbuilt safety valve in you that says you will not be arrogant. Arrogant people don't even think they might be arrogant. So that's the good news. <laughs> So, um, Jane, did you want to add something? No, I was just I was, I was just thinking about somebody I I met recently, and uh, it was at a big networking event, and and they were very arrogant, and I I was talking to my husband afterwards, saying, and and they did this, and they just walked off. So we'd we'd finished our conversation, they didn't even say goodbye, they just walked off. It's like I'd finished with you, and yeah. they just walked off. And I was like, I just can't believe he did that. No. And my husband's like. But people do. They don't realize that. It's like, oh, yes. I'd never do that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're thinking you might be arrogant, like I said, you've already got your answer yeah. for, yeah. oh, am I being arrogant? The real thing about promoting your brand, this isn't about 
get yourself a gang of cheerleaders, and everywhere you go, have them shouting amazing things about you. What you actually want to be doing is just using all the channels you currently have, but using them very, very cleverly. And I'm going to just tell you about that. So when people come into contact with you, I said right at the beginning, people are looking for clues, okay? They are looking at, have you got a wedding ring? What does your accent sound like? You know, have, what's that watch like? What's that handbag like? Because the brain is just trying to take those on board. Now, it isn't just the first seven seconds. It carries on all the while that people are interacting with you. They're picking up clues. And your first seven seconds, I should point out, isn't necessarily when you walk into a room and shake hands with someone. It can be by any of these channels. So there are written ways that people come into contact with you. So some of the things are your email that you send them, the signature you have in your email, the LinkedIn profile you have, the presentation slides, what your spelling's like on there, um, any reports you write, any CV you send, the covering letter you have, the wording on your business card. These are all written ways. Even if you come to my desk and I'm not there and I've never met you before and you write a little note and you stick the post-it to my screen, my first seven-second impression of you will be from your, what you've written and from your handwriting. And I will be making all manner of, of assumptions about that, right or wrong. You then have verbal channels, okay? These are all the ways I'm picking up clues to you through my ears. I'm getting a telephone call from you. I'm hearing your voicemail. I'm hearing your ringtone. Now, if any of you have ever been on a train and heard a ringtone, and without even seeing someone, you've made assumptions that that person is an idiot, you are picking up clues to their brand. It might be verbally that we're meeting one-to-one, -one, or I'm in a meeting and you're someone else is in the room, or maybe we're Skyping or teleconferencing, or you're standing up and doing a presentation, or I'm hearing you chit-chat to someone else, or I've said, hi, how are you, and I'm listening to your answer. These are all verbal channels that... I will be picking up clues to your brand. And conversely, there are opportunities for you to give me clues to your brand. The last way is physical. As the picture shows there, it's everything from a handshake to what you're wearing to your body language, your eye contact, the mobile phone you use, the um, iPad or whether you use any other sort of technology, the car you drive up in, the business card you hand me, the pen you write with, the pad you write on, the state of your desk, all of these things are physical ways that I'm going to make assumptions about you. Now, if you're canny, you know what your brand is, you've got your definition, you almost do, you do a little audit, and you go through all the tiny little ways that people pick up clues to your brand, and you ask yourself, am I giving the right messages? Are they going to pick up the right things? And if you use all of them, and you make sure that the answer is yes, However people come into contact with you, you start building up lots of tiny little messages that start creating that sort of gentle slope that I was talking about. Because you don't know how I'm going to come into contact with you, so you want to make sure I have a great experience, however it is. Now I'm just going to take one example and talk about an opportunity that you have. And here we have voicemail messages. I just realized I missed a poll question out before. But what I want to do is we have a poll question to do with voicemail, and I'd just like to ask um, if it's Janet to please put it up. The question about whether your voicemail, thank you, does your voicemail message promote your personal brand in a positive way? So if you could just click your answer, please, that would be great. Maybe you haven't recorded one. Maybe you've recorded one, but you know it's not fantastic. And maybe you've recorded one, and you know it's really darned good. Okay, let's just see what the answers are. Does it come up? Um, does the poll have ended? How can I see the answers? Um, nope. Is anyone able to help me by showing the answers? Or is it just working? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Right, okay, so we've got a fairly even split, 26% of people, a quarter of you saying I haven't recorded anything, a quarter of you recorded it and think, mm, not brilliant, and a fifth of you saying, yep, yeah, I'm pleased with my brand. So here's why I was asking that question. Let's presume that I have gone to a meeting with someone that knows you and you're not there. 
and I'm saying to this person, I have the most amazing career opportunity for someone. I'm looking for a project manager who is vibrant, who's got some energy about them, who's got really good attention to detail. Um, I'm not going to have to sit on their shoulder. I want them to have the nous to just get on with stuff, you know. And um, someone who's is just a bit different, but I can't find them. Can you give me a name? And the other person says to me, yeah, you need Joe Smith. Oh, Joe Smith, I don't know them. Well, tell you what, here's their mobile number. So here's the scenarios. I've been given your phone number as a potential for this amazing career opportunity. So in scenario number one, I phone up and I get your voicemail message, and it's just the standard one that comes with your provider. So something like, this is the O2 voicemail messaging service for 07 blah, blah, blah. Now, I don't know about you, but I've asked this question a lot. How do you feel when you get a standard recorded message? People often say to me, oh, I feel really unsure because I'm not sure if I've rung the right number. You are subliminally making someone feel uncertain and associating that with part of your brand. They might also think, oh, hold on a minute, I'm meant to be getting someone who's got real attention to detail. Well, they can't have that much attention because they haven't bothered recording their voicemail message. Your voicemail message, just leaving it as the standard provider, is doing nothing to make you stand out from the crowd. So I wanted someone who was a little bit different. Mm, nah. Do you know what? I don't think I'll bother leaving a message. You will never know the opportunities you might be missing because something as simple as you haven't recorded your voicemail message. Scenario number two is I might phone up and get a message that goes, Hi, this is Joe. I'm sorry I can't take your call at the moment, but please leave me a message. Well, that doesn't work as well as it might on a few different levels. Firstly, if you hear the, name, the word, I'm sorry, in your head, you subliminally associate it with a negative. I'm sorry denotes something is wrong. So don't add it in unless you really have to. The voice sounds a bit lackluster, and hold on a minute, I was told this person was really dynamic. Well, they didn't sound dynamic, so I don't think I'm buying into that. And you know what? I don't really get a good feel about them. It was just it sounded like they couldn't be bothered. So there you go. I'm not going to leave a message again. Message. Scenario number three, what I really want is I want to get a message that sounds exactly as it would sound as if you'd answered the phone. And for those of you who answered C, that 21% of you, give yourself a pat on the back. But even then, are you making the most of your voicemail message? Because a really good voicemail message will give me a very clear clue to who the person is. So as a for instance, if you phone my voicemail, you get, Hi, this is Jennifer Holloway. I'm busy right now, but I promise I'll return your call when I get your message. Thank you. You get thank you, because courtesy is a big part of my brand. You get the word promise right in the middle. I promise I'll return your call, because my number one value of my brand is taking responsibility. And if I say I'll do something, I will absolutely do it. That one tiny little word in the middle of my brand, mes my voicemail message, goes into people's minds because I actually even had someone leave me a call, a voicemail message that said, "You've promised to return my call. You better bloomin' well had." So you know that that's going through. But if it's not your brand, don't do it. Instead, I know someone else, very empathetic, and hers says, "Hi, this is Diane. I'd love to speak to you. Please leave a message." What I'm saying is really think about what you're recording. Don't just do it off the cuff and hope that it's good enough because you know what? This could be the thing that is going to make the decision whether I am buying into you. And that's just your voicemail. So all I'm going to do is just ask you to just consider this. This lady is Mae West. She was an actress in 1930s Hollywood. She was huge. She was the Madonna of her day. And she uses the phrase, it is better to be looked over than overlooked. And at the end of the day, your brand is there to sell you. Just let people know, this is what's great about me. This is what I bring to the table. If you keep that to yourself, it will never work the magic than it absolutely can. So go out there and get yourself looked over. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, that was really, really fascinating. And I think... Um, uh, certainly, I will be looking at my brand in a lot more depth, and I'm sh um, sure other people listening to the call will be thinking about what you've said today. Um, you are able to get a recording of this presentation um, if you've missed bits or want to go over bits um, again, and that will be sent out to you. Um, for more information on Jennifer, um, Jennifer has a website, um, sparkexec.co.uk. We'll type that into the um, question-answer box. 
And also, um, I got a copy of Jennifer's book today, which is Personal Branding for Brits, um, a practical guide to blowing your trumpet without sounding like an idiot or Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking forward. Very, <laughs> yeah. I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to reading that. Uh, it looks great. So, um, so that's if you want a bit more information um, about um, Jennifer's um, branding, personal branding, and learning more about that. Um, thank you very much today, um, Jennifer, um, for coming and talking to us um, on the webinar. And I'm now going to pass over to Fiona um, to talk about some forthcoming webinars. Thank you. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I hope you really enjoyed that session. I think it was a great session by Jennifer. Um, just to let you know, I've put up there on the screen, you can see the forthcoming webinars that we have. Um, on the 24th of April, another lunchtime session, we have a great session presented by Heather Montoot, who's doing a session on making the transition from technical expert to professional leader. Um, so obviously, if you're interested in attending that session, get in touch with Janet Barker. Um, and likewise, we've got a session on the 29th of May on finding your pathway to success with Richard Winfield. On the 26th of June, we have How to Land Your First CEO Role, and that's an interview by Jane with Jerry Gray, who's the Managing Director of Veridus. And our final one before the summer is on the 17th of July, and that's Establishing a Portfolio Career, presented by Barry Hobson. Some of you may actually have heard Barry, um, who presented a similar session back in August, I think, actually last year, um, and this will be a bit of a refresher. Plus, also, he's going to um, go into some more detail on that. It was a great session last year. So, if you are interested, um, if you can get in touch with Janet Barker and book your places on there. Um, and just for further reference, you can um, gain copies of the slides um, either from the Open University website or by actually logging into the Career Farm website. We have the login details on there. And also for Career Tips, you can sign up to our newsletter as well. We send out regular newsletters um, with very useful information in there on, on career aspects. So I'd like to thank everybody very much. Thank you for Janet who's working away in the background. Um, thank you very much to Jennifer for a great presentation and for Jane for hosting our Q&A session. Uh, we hope to see you all in April. Thank you very much.